Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 74, Grecobactria, Land of a Thousand Cities. On the outskirts of Bukhara in modern Uzbekistan, seven locals toiled under the blistering heat in the summer of 1867. Digging amidst the desert-like landscape, one Uzbek saw a metal protrusion emerging from its dusty enclosure. As he began to scrape away the detritus, the man realized that what he was uncovering was not merely a scrap of bronze or iron, but gold. It was a golden coin, measuring just over two inches in diameter and weighing nearly six ounces. Twice the size of an American quarter dollar and a two euro coin, the gold value alone of this specimen would command a price of $10,000 today. For a poor and often hungry laborer, the 19th century equivalent of the coin's worth would have been a princely sum indeed. A fight immediately broke out amongst the men. Of the seven that walked out to the fields that day, only two remained standing. With blood-soaked daggers in one hand and the coin in the other, the pair made a pact to travel to Europe to sell their hard-won prize. In Paris, the Uzbek held a meeting with a prominent French numismatist, Gaston L. Furardin, who purchased the specimen for £1,000, approximately £115,000 today. Gaston in turn sold it to the Royal Collection of Napoleon III, the predecessor of the National Library of France, for an incredible £6,000, nearly £700,000 today. This is the story that we are told, at least by Gaston himself. Variations of this tale circulated throughout the 1860s and 1870s, but the sequence of events remains reasonably consistent, and the coin is housed in the Cabinet du Médaillé to this very day. But why all the fuss and intrigue surrounding this piece of gold? On the front of the coin is a profile of a Hellenistic king, wearing a Boeotian-styled cavalry helmet adorned with a bull's ears and horns to signify divinity, and with a diadem upon his brow. On the reverse are two richly detailed horsemen, identified as the divine twins Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri, along with an inscription, of the great king Eucratides. Truly a spectacular find. This species of Eucratides, known as the Eucratidion, was the largest denomination of currency from the ancient world that has ever been discovered. Yet, it was just as important, if not more so, for its link to those that minted it. Stretching across much of Central Asia, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom had emerged during the Hellenistic period, following its secession from the Seleucid Empire during the mid-3rd century BC, and minted a series of spectacular coins that drew the eyes of both academics and treasure hunters alike. The acquisition of the Eucratidion coincided with the fever pitch of the coin-hunting movement, brought about by the political and social upheaval of the Great Game fought between the British and Russian empires over Afghanistan and the surrounding areas, the lands formerly ruled by Eucratides. The world of the Greco-Bactrians and their successors, the Indo-Greeks, have captivated generations of historians and scholars down to the present day, some of whom have labeled Greek-controlled Central Asia and India as the Hellenistic Far East. These were the farthest limits of the world where Greek settlers and culture existed in any significant capacity a consequence of the conquests of Alexander the Great and the work of his successors. Compared to most of the Hellenistic world, it is shocking to see how poor our evidence is for this region. Perhaps it is because of the scarcity of information, and no doubt the exotic allure of classical civilization thriving in Central and South Asia, that so much speculation and mythologizing has taken place, exacerbated by whatever hints that we do have. Our perception of the classical world, focused chiefly on the peoples and places of the Mediterranean, tends to situate Bactria on the distant periphery. Such is the nature of the sources, who were primarily Greeks and Romans interested in their own affairs. Yet ancient Bactria and Sogdiana can be described as the crossroads of Eurasia. They occupied a key position within a larger framework that saw the mixing of cultures and communities from the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, the Iranian heartland, the grasslands of the steppes, China, and India. Even with regards to the ancient world, 
The Hellenistic period is often subject to guesswork and limited information due to gaps in our sources. But to say that we have limited information on Greek Central Asia and India is to put it mildly. All the literary accounts of the Greco-Roman authors that mention Greco-Bactria and the Indo-Greek kingdoms amounts to roughly seven pages of material. Most of it's sporadic and too insufficient to create any serious chronology beyond a cursory narrative framework. The main sources we can draw upon include the historian Polybius of Megalopolis during the 2nd century BC, the geographer Strabo, writing in the time of the Emperor Augustus in the 1st century BC, the epitomizer Justin, summarizing an earlier universal history written by the Gallo-Roman Pompeius Trogus of the 1st century AD, and lastly bits from the Paraplus of the Erythrian Sea, written by an anonymous sailor describing the trade networks of the Red Sea and Indian Ocean during the 1st century AD. The ancient historians tend to focus on events in the Mediterranean, or at least events that were relevant. For example, both Strabo and Pompeius Trogus were primarily interested in the rise of Parthia, Rome's great eastern imperial rival, whose origins are intimately tied with that of Greco-Bactria. Polybius only covers Bactria so long as it's relevant to the career of the Seleucid king Antiochus III. It is unknown if any writers of history emerge out of Greco-Bactria or the Indo-Greek kingdoms, for even if there was, none of their work has survived to the present. Despite this skeletal collection, the Hellenistic Far East is incredibly unique because we can rely on sources outside of the Greek and Roman tradition. Explorers commissioned by the emperors of Han China visited Bactria just after the collapse of Greek rule, their reports having survived in the writings of court historians. In fact, the fall of Greco-Bactria holds the distinction of being the first event in world history recorded by authors from both the Mediterranean and East Asia. We also possess a few Indian sources as well, most notably a philosophical dialogue between a Buddhist sage and an Indo-Greek ruler. A handful of inscriptions survive, with a few only recently discovered within the last 25 years. Archaeological evidence is scarce, and despite being the fabled Land of a Thousand Cities, the only significant settlement to have been found remains the city of Ai Khanum in southeastern Afghanistan. Our most valuable tool in establishing chronology is undoubtedly numismatics, the study of coins. As seen in my introduction, Bactria was able to admit spectacular gold and silver coin specimens, easily some of the most impressive in the ancient world. Through the study of coins, die casts, and hoard locations, we can piece together a list of kings along with an approximate spread of control and influence. If we were to rely exclusively on literary and epigraphical accounts, we would only be able to pinpoint the names of about eight Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek rulers. Through recovered coinage, this number jumps to over 40. But without a steady written account running parallel to our coin finds, interpretations of who these men and women were are questionable at best. And at their worst, we get largely fictitious reconstructions of a ruler's personality and genealogy based on coin portraits alone. The use of coins have since moved beyond a checklist of rulers, and through careful analysis, they enable us to learn about the environment of Bactria and its inhabitants. To add to the problem, excavations and further investigation have been significantly hampered by instability and warfare in Central Asia over the past 50 years, particularly in Afghanistan. Black markets for historical artifacts have expanded operations as insurgent groups and poverty-stricken locals have taken advantage of distracted governments by plundering coin hoards and potential dig sites, dispersing these goods to collectors and buyers across the world. This isn't a recent phenomenon either. Such behaviors were common practice among prospective coin hunters during the 19th century, eager to sate the hunger of museums and coin aficionados who would pay great sums to acquire any scrap of Greek Asia that they could get their hands on. In the 20th century, tensions during the Cold War meant that access to much of Central Asia was largely limited to Soviet archaeologists, whose work was unavailable for, or not sought out by, scholars on the other side of the Iron Curtain. At the time of writing this series in mid-2021 through early 2022, the United States has just evacuated Afghanistan after 20 years of occupation leaving the country in control of the Taliban, and Kazakhstan has witnessed severe civil unrest and protests. How this bodes for the future of research remains to be seen, but it does not appear to be an optimistic one.
With a lack of sources and a unique geographical position, scholars have been divided as to how to view and interpret the Greeks of Asia from a historical perspective. William Woodthorpe Tarn, a British pioneer of Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek studies, titled his 1938 work, The Greeks in Bactria and India, asserting the primacy of the Greco-Bactrian's Hellenic identity and wholeheartedly viewing it in the lens of classical studies rather than taking into consideration the role of either Indian or Central Asian civilizations. Writing almost 20 years after Tarn, the Indian scholar Adwad Kishore Narayan published the landmark book The Indo-Greeks, coining the term that we use to describe the kingdoms that survived in northwest India. Narayan firmly believed that the Indo-Greeks belong within the sphere of South Asian studies, downplaying the impact of Greek culture as ephemeral, and that rather than the Greeks Hellenizing the Indians, quote, the Greeks came, the Greeks saw, but India conquered. While both are remarkable contributions to the field, decades of new research and archaeological finds have greatly expanded our knowledge base about the Greco-Bactrians and Indo-Greeks alike, and challenged both of their core theses. As always, the truth is more complicated. This will be one of several episodes we spend on the Hellenistic Far East, a span of time covering from Alexander the Great's invasion of Bactria and India, ending at the rise of the Kushan Empire, a period of over 400 years. Given the paucity of sources, a simple retelling of events might be slightly underwhelming at best and utterly convoluted at worst. To compensate, I wish to go beyond a reconstructed chronology. Discussions about the nature of identity, analysis of artifacts and inscriptions, rigorous examination of ancient sources, all and more will be integral to this venture. Though the Asiatic Greeks will form the center around which this series is constructed, plenty of attention will be spent on the peoples they encountered and interacted with. In many cases, we'll be looking at their point of view, topics such as the interaction of Hellenistic society and Buddhism, the expeditions of the Chinese into Central Asia, and the migration of the Eurasian nomads. Supplementing this work will be a series of interviews with some of the foremost experts in the field. This is easily the most highly requested and ambitious show project to date, something that has filled me with both trepidation and excitement to plan and carry out. Because of the extensive number of notes and references that I've accumulated, I strongly encourage all listeners to look at the episode transcripts that I have made available with links in the podcast descriptions and on my website directly. Now that we have finally arrived, I hope you enjoy our deep dive into Bactria, the land of a thousand cities. To begin with, it is important that I give you an idea of the landscape that is included under the general umbrella term of the Hellenistic Far East. The borders of regions can only be talked about in the broadest sense during the ancient period, even more so given the lack of evidence. The geographic spread of the Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek kingdoms can be said to have covered from the edges of modern Kyrgyzstan, across Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and extended into northwest India. This includes major features such as the Eurasian steppe, the mountains of the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas, and the river systems of the Amu Darya and the Indus. This is an enormous swath of land, but let us cover the approximate location of each area, region by region. First is Sogdiana, also known as Sogdia. This is the northernmost extent of Greek rule, approximately covering Uzbekistan and parts of Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan, situated between the Amu Darya and Sir Darya rivers, what the ancients would call the Oxus and Jixartes rivers respectively. The eastern part of Sogdiana includes the fertile lands of the Fergana Valley, a geological depression fed by tributaries of the Sir Darya and hemmed in by the Tian Shen and Pamir Mountains. Sogdiana is bordered to the west by the Kizilkum Desert, but to the north are the great grasslands of the Eurasian steppe. The Sogdians themselves had an extremely close relationship with the nomadic tribes living along the steppes, and the region would become famous for its horse rearing. To the southwest of Sogdiana is the land of Margiana, encompassing most of Turkmenistan. 
Much of this territory is covered by vast sandy deserts or salt flats, such as the Karakum Desert, but settlements were clustered around oases like Merv. Travel in this territory necessitated the use of resilient pack animals, namely the famous Bactrian camels, the two humped cousins of the one humped dromedary of North Africa and Arabia. To the northwest of Margiana would be Parthia, roughly northern Turkmenistan and southern Kazakhstan. Bordered by the Caspian Sea to the east, the Kopadag Mountains to the west, and the grasslands to the north, Parthia would be the natural corridor from the steppes into the Iranian Plateau. Returning back to our starting position and located just south of Sogdiana, the core of Greek Central Asia would be Bactria, with much of the landscape including northern Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and southern Uzbekistan, Bactria was considered the wealthiest and most agriculturally prosperous area. Its flat oases were supplemented by tributary systems that splintered from the Amu Darya, which bisected the land horizontally and marked its northern border with Sogdiana. Eastern Bactria was a combination of foothills and well-watered plains, enabling the growth of urban settlements and turning the area into a center of political and economic activity. The eastern flank was along the Badakhshan Mountains, a source of precious gems and important minerals such as the rich blue hue of lapis lazuli. The west, meanwhile, is flat, and not as densely populated due to its lack of supportive river systems. Its southern regions would be enclosed by the heights of the Hindu Kush, the gateway to India. Parapamisidai is poorly defined, as this is the name of the Persian satrapy, and little is known of its extent during Greek rule. Near Parapamisidai is Gandhara, the flat plains of the Kabul and Peshawar valleys that are surrounded by the mountains, with the Swat River to the north. Like with Bactria and the Oxus, the defining feature of Gandhara is the Indus River that cuts from north to south, with the Kabul River snaking its way eastward down the Hindu Kush, before emptying into the Indus. Once past the Indus, you are in northwestern India, with the later Indo-Greek rulers like Menander possibly campaigning as far as the lower Ganges to Pataliputra, modern Patna, before retiring to the Punjab and the land of the five rivers, the Indus, Hydaspes, Akesinos, Hydraotis, and Hyphasis, the modern Indus, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, and Sutlej, respectively. Turning southwest from Gandhara, we come to the region of Arakosia, extending across the Kandahar region of Afghanistan into Pakistan, perhaps as far as the Indus or the Bolan mountain pass. Arakosia did not remain in the hands of the Greeks for long, since it was quickly ceded to Chandragupta Maurya by Seleucus I in 303, but eventually was reconquered by the Greco-Bactrian rulers in the early 2nd century. West of Arachosia is Ariana, bordered by Bactria to its north, the Carmanian Desert to the west, and situated around the Afghan Harirud River. Such is the approximate geographic organization of Hellenistic Central Asia and India and please do check out the notes of this episode on my website for some helpful maps and images for guidance. With such a diversity of landscape, it is only fitting that the climate of Central and South Asia can be equally varied as well. In the mountainous areas, it can plummet to sub-zero temperatures, while some of the valleys and steppes can be reached upwards of 45 to 50 degrees Celsius in the summertime. Aridity is a constant problem in Central Asia, and the amount of rainfall per year can be pathetically small, creating stretches of dry and dusty plains. Like with Egypt and the Nile, the communities of Bactria and Sogdiana were dependent upon the life-giving waters of the Amu Darya and Sir Darya. Fed mainly by snowmelt and mountainous streams, the inundation of the rivers could become a powerful tool for agriculturalists, provided that they put the effort to maintain the extensive irrigation systems that watered the oases and valleys. By contrast, the seasonality of the monsoons of India can cause lands to be divided into periods of desperate heat and drought, but then give way to a great deluge of rain by June or July that results in the transformation of arid scrub into a canopy of green. It is precisely because of the agricultural potential of the Oxus that we see the earliest signs of urbanization during the Bronze Age. The Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex, known as BMAC for short, refers to a general classification for an urban civilization settled along the Oxus that emerged just before the turn of the 3rd millennium BC. 
a shared development of skilled metalworking and complex city structures, including the foundation of the city of Bactra in modern Balkh, mark this period. As early as 2200 BC, the region's key geographic position was attracting the attention of outside powers, and Bactria was soon integrated into the wider trading network of Eurasia. Outposts of the Harappan or Indus Valley civilization began appearing on the outer rims of the Badakhshan Mountains at Shortugai, presumably a trading post to get access to the lapis lazuli in the region. Afghanistan is also one of the only major sources of tin, one of the two components essential in the making of bronze, and thus of great value for the major powers of the Near East and Egypt throughout the Bronze Age. A symbiotic relationship would also develop between the settled Bactrians and the nomadic peoples of the steppes. Metal tools, jewelry, and weapons were traded for livestock and other animal products, such as horses. Following the end of the BMAC in the mid-second millennium, life in Bactria and Sogdiana remained largely unchanged. Various major powers could extend their influence from either India or the Iranian Plateau, but the first confirmed foreign power to occupy the region would be the Achaemenid Persian Empire. The conquest of Bactria took place under the oversight of the founder of the empire, Cyrus the Great, as suggested by the later Darius I on the Behistun inscription of 520 BC. Among his description of the Persian satrapies, Herodotus lists it as the 12th district of the empire, providing a yearly payment of 360 talents of silver to the treasury of Persepolis. The reliefs adorning the walls of Persepolis proudly display Bactrians coming to pay their respects and offer tribute to the great king, notably accompanied by a Bactrian camel. Despite the grandiose boasting of Darius, little is actually known about the nature of Persian rule in the so-called Upper Satrapies, as there are few archaeological remains that have been discovered. Scholars tend to not be as interested in Achaemenid Central Asia as they have been for Hellenistic Central Asia, so the record is even more sparse. Thankfully, a preserved archive containing administrative documents written on leather skins in Imperial Aramaic has illuminated this dark period but it appears that by all extents the Persians did not wish to meddle too much in the pre-existing framework of the region. Bactra, also known as Zaryaspa, served as the capital of the satrapy, and is also where the Greeks derived their name Bactria. The Greek knowledge of Bactria was limited prior to the 4th century. It was on the edge of the known world, a place where only legendary conquerors like Cyrus the Great of Persia or Semiramis of Assyria dared march but authors such as Herodotus and Ctesias could draw their information from Persian sources. A curious tale that stemmed later from the Alexandrian tradition speaks of a people living in Sogdiana known as the Bronchidae. Evidently, these were the descendants of a clan of Milesian Greeks deported by Xerxes following the Battle of Plataea. They apparently had sided with the Persians and committed sacrilege against a local temple, for which they feared retribution and begged the great king for help. While the Branchidae would meet a grim fate during the time of Alexander, the practice of deportation to Bactria and Sogdiana was commonly employed by Persia. The Bactrians and various peoples living in the region were viewed as an important element of the empire, and a major source of manpower to be directly looked after by one of the relatives of the great king. The defeat of Darius III at the Battle of Gaugamela in 331 generally marks the end of the Persian Empire in the sense that no great assemblies would be called on behalf of the great king to stop the Macedonian army of Alexander the Great. Darius and his remaining followers fled into the upper satrapies to regroup and try to reconsolidate power, but a mutiny saw the great king imprisoned and eventually murdered by a conspiracy among his own ranks, headed by the satrap of Bactria named Bessus. Alexander was not far behind, hoping to take Darius alive, but to no avail. This inaugurated a Bactrian campaign, whereby Alexander would seek to punish the murderers of his predecessor and finally put an end to any resistance from Persian officials or local chieftains. In contrast to the lightning speed of the Macedonian army as they moved from Europe to Egypt and Iraq during the first four years of the campaign, the conquest of Bactria and Sogdiana was a long slog of marches and countermarches from early 329 to mid 327. Alexander did not just have to deal with pretenders to the Persian throne. Warlords and military strongmen littered the region, unwilling to bend the knee to the arrival of foreign invaders. There was no single authority to contend with, 
meaning that each pocket of resistance needed to be systematically rooted out and eliminated. As soon as the Macedonians vacated the premises, another revolt or rebel leader would emerge to take its place. The climate and geography of the region must have compounded the struggles faced by the troops as well. Men froze to death during the winters, and access to drinking water always remained a major problem thanks to the region's aridity. It is unsurprising then that massacres against both enemy troops and civilians alike, including the previously mentioned Bronchidae, became a common terror tactic used by Alexander to try and quell resistance, and as a way for the troops to vent their frustration. While the wholesale enslavement and killing of non-combatants was largely an accepted byproduct of ancient warfare, the number of deaths inflicted upon the local population was quite staggering. Anywhere up to 120,000 Bactrians could have directly lost their lives during the fighting. To ensure that Bactria and Sogdiana remained within his control, Alexander set up several garrisons and military colonies. These were to be filled with thousands of Greek mercenaries and aged veterans from his army. While reality was a far cry from the supposed 70 cities founded by Alexander, Bactria by and large experienced the greatest concentration of Greek colonization out of all the other satrapies under his control. Following his siege of the Sogdian Rock in 327, Alexander married Roxana, reputedly the second most beautiful woman in Asia. Despite the insistence of the ancient authors that it was love at first sight on the king's part, it is important to note that her father was Oxyarctes, one of the most important nobles of Bactria. There could have been a genuine romantic connection between the two, but Alexander was also forging a political alliance between himself and the Bactrian and Sogdian elites. Ever the pragmatist, Alexander placed many of these local strongmen and nobles in administrative roles, overseeing his Central Asian and Indian satrapies, including his father-in-law Oxyartes and the later Indian kings, Takshilis and Poros. These men understood the political landscape better than any Greek, and could be useful allies, though Alexander made sure to leave Macedonian commanders behind to act as a guarantor of the local leader's good behavior. For the most part, Alexander was able to head to India without having to worry about a full-scale revolt as he had before. However, Macedonian control over Bactria remained precarious. Ironically, this instability would be from Alexander's own men, rather than through another indigenous uprising. A rumor of the king's death in India prompted a smaller rebellion in 326-325. Word soon reached the Greek settlers in Bactria of Alexander's death in Babylon in June of 323, whereupon they immediately revolted and attempted to march back to the Mediterranean. Diodorus suggests 23,000 men had formed this homesick army, which indicates the extent of colonization within the area that occurred under Alexander. This was dealt with by the commander Python, who initially wanted to cut a deal with the rebels as a way to take control of the region as an independent warlord, but was forced to massacre them wholesale on the orders of the standing region Perdiccas. As the wars of the successors intensified in the western regions of Alexander's former empire, the Upper Satrapies, the provinces east of Mesopotamia, which included much of the Iranian plateau and parts of India, gradually gained their independence. Many of the Macedonian commanders left behind were either drawn into the conflict, murdered at the hands of the indigenous population and disaffected colonists, or disappear from the record entirely. Out of all the successors, the reunification of the upper satrapies would be left to Seleucus, the eponymous founder of the Seleucid Empire. Initially a background player of the wars of the Diadohoi, Seleucus was promoted to the position of Satrap of Babylonia, and eventually became one of the main contenders in the conflict. Following his victory over the Antigonids during the Babylonian War in 309, he embarked on a military expedition to reconsolidate the upper satrapies. Little is known about the event, but he seems to have been quite successful. Seleucus even launched an invasion across the Indus River and warred with the Indian Emperor Chandragupta Maurya, but eventually the two came to terms in the year 303. Using 500 war elephants gained as part of the treaty with Chandragupta, Seleucus managed to win a spectacular victory against the Antigonids at the Battle of Ipsus in 301. He was now in control of almost the entirety of Alexander's Asian provinces, stretching from Asia Minor to Bactria and Sogdiana. Given the challenge of maintaining such a vast territory, and perhaps to avoid dynastic strife, Seleucus raised his son Antiochus to the status of co-king, 
and sent him to oversee the upper satrapies in 294. Relegating the junior ruler to the east was not meant to diminish Antiochus, nor the importance of the upper satrapies. Bactria and Sogdiana were not viewed as peripheral outliers, but core territories which provided an economic and military boon to the empire as a whole. Apame, Seleucus' wife and Antiochus' mother, was the daughter of a powerful Sogdian warlord, Spinomanes, who led one of the massive revolts during Alexander's campaign, sending his half-Sogdian son, who may have been taught the language by his mother, was a smart move if Seleucus was looking to curry goodwill for an area that had given Alexander so much trouble, and had only just been brought under Macedonian control again. Seleucid propaganda was also not above catering to the local Iranian population when needed. The choice of Apollo as the dynasty's patron deity and depiction of the god as a bowman on their coinage could evoke Iranian models of kingship, which stressed the image of the king as a great warrior archer. In terms of military output, the Seleucids could call upon vast numbers of Iranian cavalrymen and troops to serve in their armies. One of the chronicles recorded by the astronomers of Babylon lists 20 elephants being delivered from Bactria for the war effort against Ptolemy II Philadelphus in 274. It was during this time we see Seleucid activity within Central Asia at its most intensive. Antiochus I would build several cities within the region, either creating brand new settlements or refounding and adding to previous outposts of Alexander. Though it was greatly expanded on during the Greco-Bactrian period, Antiochus likely oversaw the foundation of the city of Iconum, the only Greek settlement in Bactria to have been preserved and extensively excavated. Rather than giving Alexander the credit for the monetization of the economy of the upper satrapies, much of this was tied directly to the policies of Seleucus and Antiochus, who established the main mint of the region in the city of Bactra. Though Bactria and Sogdiana were indeed considered important to the integrity of the Seleucid realm, we also can see how imperial propaganda could change its perception to suit its interests. A Seleucid general named Demodamus had explored the region between the Jaxartes River and the Aral Sea, marking the end of his journey by consecrating altars to Apollo at the banks of the river. Demodamus may have also been responsible for overseeing the refounding of Alexandria Eshkate into Antioch and Scythia, which may have been attacked by the nomads during the period following Alexander's death. These actions may be seen as symbolically demarcating the boundaries between the quote-unquote civilized Greek Seleucid world and that of the wild frontier of the steppes. A precedent could be found with Alexander himself when he established the altars at the banks of the Hyphasis River to mark the end of his journey in India. Following Seleucus' assassination in 281, Antiochus would spend the rest of his career in Syria and the eastern Mediterranean. From the 270s to the 240s, both Antiochus I and his son Antiochus II Theos would dedicate their time and energy to combating their Ptolemaic rivals in Egypt or dealing with affairs in Asia Minor instead. Regardless of a lack of sources, we can safely assume that the direct presence of Seleucid monarchs in Bactria and Sogdiana had gradually declined as attention was focused to the western parts of the empire. This may be attested to by numismatics. Of the surviving Seleucid coins minted in Bactria, 62 specimens have been recovered from the time of Antiochus I, yet only two date to Antiochus II. As a consequence of this prolonged absence or lack of attention, a rift had developed between the local officials and the imperial household. Despite being given important roles with a great degree of power, the lack of any direct oversight may well have given the satraps confidence to lord over their assigned territories. They may have paid lip service to the crown on paper, but a time of great turmoil could provide the excuse for these men to make a grab for further power. And a crisis is exactly what happened next. In the year 246, Antiochus II died of unknown circumstances. A subsequent dynastic feud both within and between the Seleucid and Ptolemaic houses resulted in the outbreak of the Third Syrian War, with Ptolemy III Euergetes launching a full-scale invasion against Seleucus II Callinicus that penetrated the Seleucid heartland as far as Mesopotamia. 
Less than a few years later, a civil war broke out between Seleucus and his younger brother Antiochus Hyrax, further throwing the kingdom into chaos. According to the traditionally accepted narrative, two satraps decided to exploit the anarchy in the western territories and make a bid for independence. The first was Andragoras, an Iranian-born noble who oversaw the region of Parthia. Perhaps he had attempted to leverage a chance at kingship with the support of a disaffected Iranian community. The coins bearing his name are reminiscent of those of other Hellenistic kings, but with features more akin to an Iranian or Persian monarchy. However, a tribe of horse-rearing nomads known as the Parni put an end to his plans. The Parni had originally been members of the Dahai Confederacy, along with other tribes of the steppe, and sometime around the early 3rd century they had broken off and settled along the Caspian Sea. Hostility between them and the Seleucids soon erupted into outright warfare, as they attempted to raid into Margiana in the 280s, but the general Demodamus managed to inflict such a heavy defeat that we hear almost nothing about them for the next three decades. Around the time of Andragoras' revolt, Arsakis I was crowned as King of the Parni in the year 248 or 247 at the city of Asak, dated as the foundation year of the Parthian era. A talented and ambitious leader, Arsakis must have realized the tumultuous situation faced by the Seleucid kings, and the opportunity to move into better and more productive lands was too tempting. Exploiting the distraction of the Seleucids, Arsakis launched an attack against Andragoras and killed him, putting an end to the would-be dynast's plans. By 239, the domain of Arsakis would include both Parthia and Hyrcania, the regions along the eastern border of the Caspian Sea. This marked the effective beginning of the Parthian Empire, as the Parni would be known thereafter as the Parthians, which would become one of the great states of the ancient world. According to Justin, in the same period as Andragoras' rebellion and Arsaki's invasion of Parthia, the satrap of Bactria was a man named Diodotus. We don't know much about his background nor his relationship with the Seleucids, but he seems to have been an experienced official in Bactria for several years. Allegedly inspired by Andragoras and the weakness of the Seleucids, Diodotus would declare himself king. Coins were struck in his name bearing the expression, of the king Diodotus, in Greek, and his profile was adorned with the royal diadem. Abandoning the Seleucid image of a seated Apollo, he chose the iconography of Zeus standing astride wielding a thunderbolt. It was appropriate. The name Diodotus translates to God-given or Zeus-given. The growing power of the Parthians directly threatened Bactria, and Diodotus led an army against Arsakis to prevent the nomads from invading. He managed to drive the Parthians out of the area, his military victory inaugurating his reign as the first king of what can now be called the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, earning him the epithet Soter, or Savior. Diodotus I died shortly after these events, and the next king of Bactria would be his son, Diodotus II. The younger Diodotus was more willing to come to terms with the Parthians than his father, and struck a peace agreement between himself and Arsakis as a part of a mutual understanding of each other's claims. All of the events that transpired in Bactria and Parthia were not lost upon Seleucus II. After securing a peace treaty with Ptolemy III and entering into a state of uneasy coexistence with Antiochus Hyrax, Seleucus launched an expedition into the upper satrapies to restore his authority. Perhaps by 236 or 235, the Seleucid army invaded Parthia and clashed with Arsakis, sending the Parthian king fleeing into the steppes. In a second battle, Arsakis managed to defeat Seleucus, forcing the Seleucid king to abandon Parthia altogether or recognize Arsakis as a client king. Diodotus notably did not participate in the fighting, either honoring the terms of his treaty with Arsakis or hoping to use the Parthians as a shield against Seleucid retaliation. This reasonably coherent chain of events has generally been accepted as the beginning of Greco-Bactria as an independent state. Unfortunately, reality is not so kind. At best, this is a loose reconstruction and reconciliation of very messy sources. As I have relayed to you, the traditional narrative generally agrees upon the year 246-245 as the turning point for Seleucid Central Asia to the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. It coincides nicely with the outbreak of the Third Syrian War, correlating with the gradual weakening of Seleucid power in the upper satrapies, 
which is claimed by authors like Justin and Strabo. These same writers also saw the rise of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and the Parthian Empire as inseparable events, as both were deeply involved in the affairs of the other. There are, of course, contradictions in our sources. The name Parthian has given rise to confusion since it could refer to either the residents of the satrapy or the name of the nomadic Parni who later settled there. Some neglect to mention Diodotus, and others confuse him for later kings. The exact order of events has been heavily debated as well, and a dizzying number of sequences have been put forward. Never mind that, the chronology and dating of these events is also a very divisive subject. Scholars can be roughly grouped into two camps, high and low chronologists. Low chronologists accept the orthodox dating of 246-245, with the revolts occurring in the reign of Seleucus II, while the high chronologists believe that the events took place during the time of his father, Antiochus II, over ten years earlier. Though he provides the most complete account of the events in Bactria and Parthia, Justin confuses the situation by suggesting that the rebellions of Diodotus and Andragoras occurred in the reign of Seleucus II, but curiously dates it to the consulship of Manlius Vulso and Attilius Regulus, the Roman commanders of the First Punic War in 256-255. The beginning of the Parthian era in 248-247 does make Arsaki's coronation fit rather neatly into the commonly accepted framework, but this could have been retroactively dated by a later Parthian ruler. In addition to the difficulties in trying to reconcile a time for these events, there are some who challenge the traditional narrative of Bactria's separation from the Seleucid Empire and argue that the Diodotid kings were not independent dynasts, but instead some sort of vassal rulers or subordinate officials. The sheer size of the Seleucid realm made administration a daunting task, and the kings were functionally always on the move to try and cope with the issue, but they were mostly preoccupied with events in the eastern Mediterranean namely the semi-regular bouts of warfare with Ptolemies over the sovereignty of Syria. Joint kingship was one possible answer, as Antiochus I started off his career overseeing the eastern provinces while the more experienced Seleucus I focused on the western part of the empire. Yet this could also lead to civil war, as what happened with Antiochus Hyrax when he was given authority over Asia Minor. A potential solution could be found through the granting of privileges to local power holders, who could safeguard Seleucid interests in return for the right to mint their own coins or to use the title of king. Such a proposition was not uncommon for Seleucid policy. Arsakis himself was likely made into a vassal king, as his coins only bear the title Autocrator, which carries much less weight than something like Basileus. A similar arrangement may have taken place with the Adelid dynasty that oversaw Pergamon. Empires both before and afterwards would employ client kingdoms to oversee the security of their borders, so an arrangement of this nature is not out of the realm of possibility. Evidence for this lies in the dynamics of the relationships of the Seleucids and the Diodotids. Though Diodotus the Elder was said to have taken the title of king, most of the coins bearing his portrait were minted during the time of Diodotus II. The younger Diodotus also never fought against Seleucus II when the latter launched a retaliatory campaign against Arsakis, despite technically being allies with the Parthians. If Seleucus came to terms with Arsakis, there's no reason to think that he wouldn't have reached out to the Bactrians as well. It's also very possible that Diodotus pressured Seleucus into giving him the rights of kingship and coinage due to the violent struggles with the Parthians which would also explain the coin specimen celebrating the elder Diodotus' victory over the nomads. Additionally, if Bactria, a very wealthy and important province of the Seleucid realm, truly rebelled and was sundered from their grasp, it is unlikely that the Seleucids would have just accepted the loss without making a fight for it. There are also a couple pieces of information from the Ptolemaic point of view that may lend support for this line of reasoning. In the inscription issued by Ptolemy III in the town of Adulis in the modern East African country of Eritrea greatly exaggerated the king's conquests during the Third Syrian War, claiming that he took Seleucid territory up to and including Bactria. While obviously untrue, the Egyptian army only reached Babylon, it does suggest that the region was still considered a part of the Seleucid Empire by the time of the war. A collection of ancient stratagems also states that Ptolemy was able to convince all the satraps as far as India to defect to the Ptolemaic side, further supporting the idea of a loyal Bactria. 
Whether conditionally or autonomously, the Diodotids now ruled Bactria and Sogdiana on their own accord. Traditionally, the Diodotid dynasty is thought to have only lasted for two kings, with Diodotus II ruling from roughly 239 down to approximately 226. This is a fairly long period, though it is quite possible that there was a period of joint kingship between father and son, following the Seleucid practice. An argument has been put forward that there is a missing third king of the Diodotid line, based entirely on numismatic evidence. There are coin specimens that display the imagery of a typical Diodotid coin, with the thundering Zeus on the reverse and a portrait of Diodotus I on the front. Rather than bearing the name of either the elder or the younger Diodotus, it instead reads, of the king Antiochus Nicator. Some have used this evidence to support the notion that Diodotus I was a loyal satrap of Antiochus II, a transitory period before Diodotus II started minting coins with their own image and name. But analysis suggests that at least some of these coins were minted long after the elder Diodotus's death, and there are commemorative types minted by the later Indo-Greek ruler Agathocles, referring to an Antiochus Nicator as well. Additionally, Antiochus II was known by the epithet Theos, not Nicator, and the choice to mix Seleucid and Diodotid imagery has very little precedent among the other Hellenistic monarchies. Whether it was two Diodotids or three, Bactria once again goes silent in our sources for the next two decades. No Seleucid ruler visited the region during this time, and so we have little to go upon for literary accounts. In terms of numismatics, Diodotus the Younger appears to have initiated a wave of coin striking and monetization. He ordered the establishment of a second mint, and in contrast to the silver and gold issues of previous rulers and satraps, he also struck a series of bronze coins in smaller silver denominations, enabling every big Bactrians to get a hold of coin money outside of a privileged elite. Why this policy was enacted is a curious question. Perhaps it was necessary to fund some sort of building project and the payment of laborers, though there are no cities in the record that bear the name of Diodotus. It may have been necessary to pay for troops and mercenaries. Smaller denominations would have been useful in this manner, especially if the Seleucids had given Diodotus II a pass to conduct his affairs with a degree of autonomy. By the 220s, though, the political situation of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom was shaken up once again, as a man named Euthydemus appears in the record. A descendant of Ionian Greek settlers from the city of Magnesia, we aren't exactly sure of his position within Bactria, though it is quite likely he was a government official or even a Diodotus general given his later career. Shortly before 225, Euthydemus overthrew the last reigning Diodotid, establishing himself as the king and founder of the Euthydema dynasty. The coinage reflects this change as well. Instead of Zeus holding the thunderbolt, the Euthydemids chose to present the club-wielding demigod Heracles as their dynastic emblem. The next two decades saw Euthydemus establish his rule over Bactria, perhaps fighting with the Diodotids or other potential rivals challenging his usurpation. His son Demetrius, apparently a man who cut an impressive and charismatic figure, was probably made into a junior ruler to help oversee operations. A change of regime would certainly have gotten the attention of any opportunistic rulers, which is precisely what happened. For the first time in over 30 years, a Seleucid king had made an appearance in the upper satrapies. Antiochus III, the youngest son of Seleucus II, was on the move towards Bactria. He was in the middle of his Anabasis, a great eastern expedition intended to restore Seleucid control in the Iranian plateau and Central Asia after the disastrous near collapse of the dynasty in 223. A talented commander, Antiochus forced the submission of the Parthian king Arsakis II, and in 209, he had cast his eyes on the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. From what fragments we can glean from Polybius, it appears that Euthydemus attempted to stop the Seleucid king's progress by meeting him at the region of Aria, mustering an army that included, or was entirely composed of, 10,000 cavalrymen. Even if we conservatively accept half that number, 
It reveals the extensive military capabilities of the Greco-Bactrians, many of whom were probably Iranian horsemen native to the region. This cavalry was set ahead to the Arya River, the modern Hari, to act as scouts and guards, while Euthydemus himself was encamped further away. Antiochus's speedy arrival had surprised the now panicked Bactrians, who preemptively launched an attack to try and overwhelm the smaller force, joined by his personal agema of 2,000 cavalry and another 1,000 light infantry, Antiochus managed to best the Bactrian horsemen at the cost of a few teeth from an injury to his mouth during the engagement. Following the disaster at the Battle of the Arya River, Euthydemus withdrew his forces to Bactra, where he intended to fortify his position. Thus began a brutal two-year siege, lasting from 208 to 206. We are missing Polybius' account of the siege of Bactra, but the implication that Euthydemus was able to resist the efforts of one of the most powerful military forces for over two years reveals the extent of Bactra's fortifications and the ample foodstuffs of the Bactrians. Antiochus probably sent his forces across the countryside to scour for supplies and deal with resistance, but to suggest anything beyond that would be purely hypothetical, and we have little information about the interim. In 206, a Seleucid delegate named Teleus met with Euthydemus to discuss terms. The Greco-Bactrian king defended his actions, claiming that he had not revolted against Antiochus' forebears, but had destroyed those who did, referring to the Diodotids. Euthydemus also advised Teleus that allowing him to keep his position was in the best interest of the Seleucids. He alone was defending against the potential expansion of the steppe nomads like the Parthians or the Saka, a major threat to the security of both their respective kingdoms. Some have interpreted this warning as an attempt by Euthydemus to blackmail Antiochus, hinting that he could call the nomads his allies. As we recall, Diodotus II managed to make some sort of treaty or arrangement with Arsakis I, but Euthydemus appears to have been earnest in his reasoning, even though it was almost entirely out of self-interest. Antiochus agreed with the sentiment, and after spending a long time in the upper satrapies, he could not delay his return to Syria, lest he be bogged down in logistical issues or see a potential rebellion erupt back home. During the final negotiations, Euthydemus sent Demetrius in his place to ratify the treaty. The Seleucid king was apparently impressed by the regal bearing and manners of the young man, and offered to marry one of his daughters to secure the alliance. Euthydemus and Demetrius were thus allowed to retain their titles, but in return were required to hand over large quantities of grain, along with Euthydemus' remaining war elephants. Whether Antiochus actually provided the Seleucid princess is unclear though it has not stopped scholars from endlessly speculating on the dynastic workings of the Euthydemid house. Antiochus soon departed south across the Hindu Kush, and while on paper Greco-Bactria was a subordinate kingdom, he would be the last Seleucid ruler to ever journey this far east into these lands. An inscription, discovered near the city of Kulyeb in Tajikistan and making its first appearance on the Antiquities Market in 2004, gives a bit of insight into the reigns of Euthydemus and Demetrius I. It was a dedication to the goddess Hestia by a man named Heliodotos, honoring both father and son. Quote, this fragrant altar to you, August Hestia, most honored among the gods, Heliodotos established in the grove of Zeus with its fair trees, furnishing it with libations and burnt offerings, so that you may graciously preserve, free from care, together with divine good fortune, Euthydemos, greatest of all kings, and his outstanding son Demetrios, renowned for fine victories." End quote. The date of this text is thought to be between 200 and 195 BC, and there are a few interesting elements to note. Being so close to the campaigns of Antiochus III, the description of Euthydemus as Basileus Megistos, greatest of all kings, potentially reads as a poke at Antiochus's adoption of the title Basileus Megas, great king. No doubt that Euthydemus was keen to twist his agreement into a propaganda piece, celebrating a great victory over the Seleucid king. Yet, there are Euthydemid coins dating to 206 that have an anchor next to the monogram a quintessentially Seleucid symbol that reflects the subordinate relationship of Bactria to Antiochus. It is following the reigns of Euthydemus and Demetrius I that our term narrative begins to lose all meaning. For many of the rulers after these two, minus few exceptions, we only know of their existence through coinage. 
A scarcity of evidence has resulted in wildly divergent interpretations as to the chronology of the region. From what we are told, Demetrius embarked on a series of successful campaigns into India. The Kuliev inscription may have also been written shortly after the start of Demetrius' invasions, as it gives Demetrius the epithet Kalinicus, beautiful victory. A later source also describes an Arachosian city bearing the name Demetrius, presumably founded by Demetrius following the crossing of the Hindu Kush, and coins struck in his image show him wearing an elephant skin cap to symbolize his eastern conquests. We will leave the details of this campaign and the rest of the Indo-Greek kings for later, but it is important to understand that Demetrius and his successors were able to establish themselves in India in the wake of his conquests, and there are multiple Euthydemid kings ruling at the same time in both Bactria and India throughout the early 2nd century. However, there are hints of larger political changes that occurred during Euthydemid rule in Central Asia. Based upon archaeological evidence, or perhaps rather a lack thereof, it is argued that Sogdiana had been able to successfully regain its independence during the mid to late 3rd century. Few Hellenistic remains are found dating between the end of the Seleucid period to the time of the later Greco-Bactrian kings in the mid-2nd century, leading some to suggest that it fell out of Greek control during the transition from Diodotid to Euthydemid rule in the 220s or during the Siege of Bactra. It is quite possible that this was the nomadic threat that Euthydemus was referring to during his negotiations with Antiochus, as the Sogdians and nomads would have preyed upon Bactria and the exhausted Seleucid army if perceived as weak enough. Shortly following the campaigns of Demetrius, we find the name of Euthydemus II appearing in the numismatic record. He was possibly Demetrius's brother, and took control of Bactria by the early 180s, presumably after Euthydemus I had died. Along with Euthydemus II, we find two other kings in India named Agathocles and Pantaleon. It is argued that they were contemporaries, because they all minted copper-nickel coins, a copper-nickel alloy which up to that point was exclusively used by the Chinese. Few coins of Pantaleon have ever been found, suggesting that this king had ruled for only a short time. After Pantaleon, we find King Antimachus I as evidenced by a tax receipt dating to the early mid-2nd century that begins with the expression, during the reign of Antimachus Theos and Eumenes and Antimachus. The use of Theos, the god or the divine, makes Antimachus the first Greco-Bactrian ruler to explicitly adopt an epithet while they were alive, and may hint at the establishment of a royal cult. While the first name is obviously referring to Antimachus I Theos, the mysterious nature of Eumenes and this second Antimachus leaves much to the imagination. Perhaps these were other Greco-Bactrian kings that had not appeared in the numismatic record, or maybe his children raised to the status of junior rulers. The coinage of Antimachus is also quite unusual. His coin series shows him wearing the Kausia, the broad brim hat so associated with Macedonian settlers and soldiers, which is quite unique in the context of Hellenistic kingship. He also bears the distinction of being one of, if not the only Hellenistic rulers whose portrait shows himself smiling. There is too much danger in making assumptions of the personalities of kings based solely on their physical appearance on coins, but the choice of presentation is fascinating. Yet these coins and documents tell us little about what was happening in the area, and once again we are left largely in the dark. After another 25 years of silence, we get our last major Greco-Bactrian king in the sources, Eucratides I. He was not of the Euthydemid family, and no further information about his origins can be confirmed, though Tarn believed that he was related to the Seleucids. Justin claims that Eucratides came to power around the same time as King Mithridates I of Parthia, which has been dated to roughly around 170 BC. In that period, Eucratides led a civil war in Bactria possibly against Antimachus I and or the junior figures Eumenes and Antimachus II, and soon followed up with the conquest of Sogdiana. By most accounts, his rule saw the Greco-Bactrian kingdom at its height, and was deeply admired by later authors. Justin describes him as a great king, matched by his adoption of the title The Great, and is the famous ruler of a thousand cities of Strabo. Eucratides is said to have founded a major city in Bactria, appropriately named Eucratidea, which has been suggested to be the site of Iconum. The largest gold coin ever minted, the Eucratidion, was struck during his rule. Word of Eucratides' successes extended beyond Bactria, 
and inspired others to emulate him. The Seleucid usurper Timarchus of Miletus minted coins while ruling in Media that were direct copies of the Eucratidion. One coin type often dated to the reign of Eucratides carries the portrait of Eucratides wielding a javelin on the front, and on the reverse are the profiles of a man and woman named Heliocles and Laodice, respectively. A double profile on a coin face has been seen in other near-contemporary examples, notably coin types of Ptolemy II and Arsinoe II of Egypt, and it stands the reason that both Heliocles and Laodice were likely married. It is a curious specimen. Primarily because Heliocles does not wear a diadem, the symbol of royal office, but Laodike does. To some, Laodike is viewed as a Seleucid princess, given the proliferation of that name in the dynasty, and thus is the mother of Eucratides, explaining the reasoning that he was a Seleucid agent. Heliocles' origin is more obscure, though he probably was a high-ranking individual in the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. These specimens could therefore be commemorative issues of Eucratides honoring his parents. However, recent arguments suggest that Heliocles and Laodice were not necessarily the parents of Eucratides, but instead figures that were contemporary or ruled shortly after Eucratides that were evoking his image and name. Laodice may have even been Eucratides' wife. Since these two are not attested to in our sources, reconstruction is nearly impossible. At some point during his career, Eucratides launched an invasion into Arachosia and the Punjab. This led him to clash with an Indo-Greek king named Demetrius, presumably a Euthydemid ruler in Arachosia, descended from Demetrius I. Demetrius II proved to be a formidable opponent, and with an army of 60,000 men he drove back Eucratides into a citadel, or fortified settlement, whereupon he placed the usurper king under siege. Despite having only 300 soldiers, they put up a spirited defense and held out for five months before managing to break out of the city. A seemingly fantastical story, though the only one we have. Following a rendezvous, Eucratides was able to overcome Demetrius in battle, and united parts of India under his rule. But peace was not meant to last, for upon his return to Bactria, Eucratides was murdered by his own son, his body cast aside and left unburied in roughly the year 145. So ended the Golden Age of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, and the successors of Eucratides would see the realm torn apart by further fractious infighting and outside invasions within a few short decades. Before we conclude the final years of Hellenistic Bactria, let's pause our narrative for now. In the next part, we will look closer at the organization and layout of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, looking at the evidence to see how the landscape was reshaped by the arrival of thousands of Greek settlers and the response from the local Bactrians and Sogdians alike. <laughs>